Hello, everyone. I'm George Roska. And I'm Mark Schneider. And we want to welcome you to today's episode 96 of Say What, where we talk about the threats to our children in the public school system, including the widespread use of parental secrecy policies being rolled out in the school districts to keep parents in the dark about their minor children's gender identities. That's right, George. You know, these policies go by different names depending on the jurisdiction. In Oregon, they're referred to as gender support plans, but they all have the same objective, which is to hide a child's gender transition from its parents. And often, George, as we both know, with tragic consequences. Say what? Yeah, I mean, there's the case of Abigail Martinez here in California, who lost custody of her daughter in a court, permitted only one hour of visitation each week because Miss Martinez did not want her daughter to receive gender transition interventions. And tragically, George, her daughter took her own life after changing her name and starting on cross-sex hormones. This all started with her L.A. school working with social workers and LGBT activists encouraging Abigail's gender transition. Wow. And this has all been brought to light recently with a lawsuit filed in the Ninth Circuit in the Eastern District Court in the case of Aurora Regino versus Chico Unified School District officials. Um, the plaintiffs are being represented by the Dillon Law Group, um, which we see prominently on the news these days. It's a group out of uh, San Francisco. But this case is um, it's getting national publicity, and it, and it should. Um, there are 23 schools in the Chico School District, and this policy affects the entire district, as other districts in California, as we'll see. But just to give you some brief facts of the case, um, Miss Regino's fifth grade elementary school daughter was encouraged by a school counselor to adopt a male identity after she informed a school counselor that, quote, she felt like a boy, fifth grader. Immediately after this brief conversation, the counselor walked and this girl is in in the law cases being known as A.S., back to her class and informed her teacher about A.S.'s new identity and instructed that she now be called J.S., a Mm. male personal pronoun. Well, soon thereafter, all the school staff began calling A.S. by her new name, J.S., and over the following months, The district used A.S.'s male name and pronouns while at school, and the school counselor provided A.S. with additional information about continuing her transition to a male identity. All of this, George, was deliberately kept hidden from A.S.'s mother. A.S. has since enrolled in a different school and identified with a her biological gender, which she's comfortable with. But the district premised its decision to hide its actions from A.S.'s mom on a so-called parental secrecy policy. And, of course, they don't want to call it that. No, they don't. They don't want to call it that. And But basically, the, the policy um, uh, allows school officials to socially transition students who express a desire to do so. Um, this is basically giving them their new preferred pronouns and uh, use the restrooms and locker rooms of uh, of their new biological or their new gender identity and to keep it secret from parents unless the student specifically authorizes the school to inform them. And this started, George, in an arts and crafts group meeting. Now, you would think, what does arts and crafts have to do with gender identity? Well, it has a lot to do with it if the teacher running that class is an activist. Bingo. And, this, and this particular teacher was a Mrs. Robinson who led the entire class in a discussion about sexuality and gender identity. And in a follow-on discussion between A.S. and school officials involved discussions about community groups that advocated for LGBTQ plus causes and discussing breast Binding. And at one point, George, A.S. told school officials she wanted to tell her mom about her new uh, identity. But school officials were not supportive of this action. In fact, at no time did school officials suggest A.S. talk to a mental health professional, even though she also confessed to be suffering from anxiety and depression. Well, when Miss Regino confronted as justification for its secrecy policy, the school district referred her to an FAQ link from uh, from the California Department of Education 
regarding Assembly Bill 1226, which is known as the infamous bathroom bill. This is the the law that passed, I think it was 2013, 13, which allowed kids suddenly who identify as another gender, aside from their biological one, to use facilities in accordance with that that identity. Well, if you go to the actual CDE link that the school used as its premise for this parental secrecy policy, um, it, pro- it provides some questions, as FAQs normally do. And, and here's, here's an example. Question number six. May a student's gender identity be shared with the student's parents? And here's the answer. The right of transgender students to keep their transgender status private is grounded in California's anti-discrimination laws. Of course, they don't cite any, as well as federal and state laws. They don't cite any there either. Um, trans privacy, the CDE cites education code sections uh, one of which is Education Code 49060, which requires that schools keep student records private. But this code section deals with public funding of education for the disabled and has nothing to do with gender identity privacy. Nothing to do whatsoever, whatever with that. Mm-hmm. Um, another uh, section of code that they refer to is FERPA which is the Family Educational and Privacy Rights section. But again, um, this code section says that schools may only disclose information in school records with written permission from a student's parent or from the student after the student reaches age 18. Again, George, it has nothing to do with gender identity or even discrimination. And we're talking about a minor here as well, not over 18. We are talking about a minor. And they also cite, you know, the California Constitution, which says that well, minors enjoy a right privacy under Article 1, Section 1 of the California Constitution. So this is what the CD is saying to schools to give them right to hide things from parents. But here's what that Article 1, Section 1 actually says. All people are by nature free and independent and have inalienable rights. Among these are enjoying and defending life and liberty, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and pursuing and obtaining safety, happiness, and privacy. Good words. Mm -hmm. But does that sound like it gives public school officials the right to secretly transition our children? No. I don't think so. Well, here's another question on the CDE website, FAQ. What steps should a school or school district take to protect a transgender or gender nonconforming student's right privacy? And the answer that the CDE gives? Schools must consult with a transgender student to determine who can or will be informed of the student's transgender status. If anyone including the student's family. This is just made up out of whole cloth, out of, oh, out of thin air. <clears throat> Here's another one. Uh, question eight. What is a school or school district's obligation when a student's stated gender identity is different than the student's gender marker in the school's or district's official records? Here's the answer. If a student so chooses, district personnel shall be required to address the student by a name and the pronouns consistent with the student's gender identity without the necessity of legal documentation or a change to the student's official district record. The student's age is not a factor. For example, children as early as age two are expressing a different gender identity. It is strongly suggested that teachers privately ask transgender or gender nonconforming students at the beginning of the school year how they want to be addressed in class, in correspondence to the home, or at conferences with the student's parents. So can you imagine your fifth grader is going to school and every teacher in every class now has been told by the CDECE, interrogate all your children to find out what personal pronouns they want to be identified as. It's unbelievable. Absolutely. And in fact, Mark, um, this whole notion of the, the pronouns. I know that there is a court case working its way up through the state court system, and it actually ruled 
you know, against all of this, you know, craziness at the third appellate court here in California. But I, I believe that now is at the sub- California Supreme Court level to decide if, you know, uh, teachers should be forced to use children's preferred pronouns in their classroom. Yeah. I mean, these cases are sort of working their way throughout the country. It's a very healthy thing. Parents need to assert their constitutional rights to actually parent their children. Um, but the CDE goes on to say, George, if a member of the school community intentionally uses a student incorrect name and pronoun, um, it can be treated as a form of harassment that violates California's anti-discrimination laws. Again, George, they don't say which ones. They're good at that. So, you know, what are the the harms, um, among other things, of these parental secrecy policies? Well, you know, think about it. Uh, this authorizes young children to make potentially life-altering decisions without a parent's knowledge or consent. It arrogates to school officials the authority to make these decisions on behalf of the parents. It assumes parents are not fit to make decisions in the best interest of their children. It conceals information from parents regarding their own children's emotional and mental health. And it gives school officials the authority to engage in psychological and worldview indoctrination of children with parental, without parental consent or knowledge, um, and often by untrained activists. Here's the irony, George, is that these parental secrecy policies are based on these AB 1226 guidelines, none of which have the force of law, not one of them. And the Chico School District, fortunately, is being challenged in this lawsuit that was filed on the 14th Amendment, which brings up substantive, fundamental, constitutional rights of a parent to control the upbringing of their children. And this goes back to 1923 and the famous case of Myers v. Nebraska, which the court, the Supreme Court said parents have a fundamental right to establish a home and bring up children and to control the education of their own children. More recently, we've often spoke of uh, the Troxel versus Granville case that goes back to 2000. And it's that that case said that a state shouldn't interject itself in the private realm of family. The 14th Amendment liberty interest at issue in this case, the interest of parents in the care, custody and control of their children is perhaps the oldest of the fundamental liberty interests recognized by this court. And Mark, you mentioned that, you know, typically these teachers or counselors or whatever school administrators, you know, that are activists, um, I think in the vast majority of the cases that I've read so far, um, they're not parents, actually. <laughs> they don't have children. And it's interesting how people without children are trying to tell people with children how to raise their own children. It'd be very interesting to do a national study on that to see how many of these activist teachers actually are parents themselves. But, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I have a, a feeling, George, that you're right on about that. Well, if you're wondering what AB 1226 or 1226 or 1266 actually says, 1266, I, I apologize. Um, We're going to read you the actual code of what the CDC is telling schools is their justification for hiding gender transitioning from their kids. Here's what the law actually says, and it's chaptered um, in Section 221.5 of the Education Code. Here's Section A. It is the policy of the state that elementary and secondary school classes and courses, including non-academic and elective classes and courses, be conducted without regard to the sex of the pupil enrolled in these classes and courses. Okay, well, there's good and bad to that. You know, if uh, if there's an academic class, you certainly don't want to uh, tell a person of a certain gender, well, you cannot take this class. Uh, the problem uh, comes to mind when sports come into mind or, or mm-hmm. things things like that. But you, you read further down in Section D, there's some actually good language here. It says the parents or legal guardian of the pupils shall be notified in a general manner at least once in the manner prescribed in another code section in advance of career counseling and course selection, commencing with course selection for grade 7 
so that the parents may participate in these sessions and decisions. So the, so the parents are encouraged to participate in decisions about what classes to take, but not about their gender. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. In Section E, the code says participation in a particular physical education activity or sport, if required of pupils of one sex, shall be available to pupils of each sex. And then in Section F, it says a pupil shall be permitted to participate in sex segregated school programs and activities, including athletic teams and competitions. And here's the clause that really got parents upset about this law and use facilities consistent with his or her gender identity, irrespective of the gender listed on the pupil's record. But again, George, does any of this say anything about hiding the gender transition of a child from its parents? Yeah, Mark, actually, I I want to just go on the record here by saying how transphobic this statement is because they say the use of facilities consistent with his or her gender identity, which automatically mentions binary here, it should say their gender identity to be all-inclusive. Indeed, it should. But, you know, it's kind of a subtle uh, acknowledgement that (laughs) there really only are two genders and they are biologically driven. Well, you know, a lot of this stems from the changing of the meaning of sex in our laws, according to sexual orientation, gender identity, um, a worldview. Um, and this has been going on for years. In fact, Education Code Section 210.7 defines gender to include a person's gender-related appearance or behavior, whether or not stereotypically associated with the person's assigned sex at birth. Um, Section 106.2 of these new rules prohibits hostile environment harassment, which it defines as unwelcome sex-based conduct that is sufficiently severe or pervasive. The proposal also redefines sex to include gender identity. And this redefinition will likely be used to require schools to allow students to join sports teams according to their gender identity rather than the biological sex. Further, the new rule will will require school staff to refer to and address students with the same name and pronoun that matches their gender identity rather than their sex to avoid charges of hostile environment harassment. Ooh. Yeah. But for now, George, none of these existing laws mention keeping gender transition from parents, not one. And the Chico School District is not the only one citing these, quote, parental secrecy policies to hide gender cult indoctrination from parents. Um, We were recently made aware at POK that the San Diego School Districts have a similar policy. In fact, I was sent a teacher training uh, slide that was given to teachers in the Chula Vistic School District. Again, this is an untrained uh, a person, uh, an LGBT activist, um, who is telling uh, teachers that they have to abide by these secrecy laws. In fact, in one of the slides, it says AB 1266 is referred to as the, quote, School Success and Opportunity Act. That's completely untrue. It's not referred to as that. It also says all staff are to call trans and non-binary students by the chosen names and pronouns, according to AB 1266. George, that's completely false. Yes, completely agree. And Mark, these are the kind of teacher trainings that are finally starting to come out to light. And we we hear about these things from teachers, especially at conferences uh, where we go and speak. They they are really trying. Who, who's training these teachers? It's a bunch of activists. Yeah, yeah, completely. So, you know, what does this all this mean? Well, you know, there, there's an arrogance of presumption here that the state working through the school system is a better parent than you. It's the state usurping the child-parent relationship. And, George, I hate to say it, but there's not enough parents involved in challenging these laws. Fortunately, Miss Regino in the school district in Chico is uh, had the chutzpah 
you know, to contact a, a law firm and challenge this. And I'm very excited to see where this case is going to go. But more parents have to stop capitulating. They need to start challenging these false policies. So what can they do? Well, first of all, they can demand to know if the local school district has adopted a parental secrecy policy. Just ask them. You can find out. And if they're not willing to tell you, you can file a uh, FOIA uh, to demand that they tell you what's going on and what it, what it's premised on. And then you need to document all these conversations and correspondence that you have with school officials. And then please let Protect Our Kids know about it. Um, if you go to our website, protectourkidsnow.org, and you scroll down, there is a legal incident form that you can fill out. And if your case is actionable, uh, we have partnerships with uh, many public interest uh, conservative law firms around the country, and um, we will help pursue your rights. But in the meantime, George, you know, we always encourage parents, if at all possible, get your kids out of the public school system. Definitely. Get right. your, get your, get your kids out. And then finally, George, there's a parental right to protect act that is being uh, introduced um, by Congressman Virginia Fox, a Republican out of North Carolina. And this Parental Right Act, Act to Protect will ensure that Child Protective Services does not penalize parents for protecting their children from gender transition interventions. It makes states that permit that permit Child Protective Services to violate parental rights in gender transition intervention cases ineligible for Title I funds. Under the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, it defines gender transition intervention to include both social and medical transitions so parental rights are protected more broadly. And you can just Google the Parental Right to Protect Act to find out more about it. And then finally, George, you need to vote your conscience. Yep. Make sure you show up at the polls. And finally, there's no substitute for prayer. That's our most powerful weapon. It really is. So, George, that's all. I think that's all the time we have for today. Well, parents, please continue to visit our website at protectourkidsnow.org. Download our brochures. Share them with family and friends. We have many videos that you can watch. You can also download our brochure on how to start a private school or how to homeschool. Um, you can request uh, for Mark and I to come out and speak to your group uh, if you'd like. Um, and also we have the donate button you see, POK's mission is to inform parents about dangerous public school indoctrination and alternatives to public schools. So we rely on donors uh, to be able to accomplish this. Um, but our donor revenue is unpredictable, and that's why we're inviting you to join our Guardian Angels program by making a recurring monthly donation, which will enable us to help more parents get their kids out of public schools and into the safety of either private schools or homeschooling. So, parents, thank you so much for uh, listening to our podcast and for um, heeding our advice on the craziness that's going on. Until next time, on Say What?